Good afternoon. My name is Mike Snelly. I'm an extension specialist at Oklahoma State University, and I'm excited to have you back uh, to this year's Shackleford Lecture Series. So if you were with me last year, thank you. If you're new to this year, welcome aboard. We're going to do things a little bit differently here in 2022. We've uh, making the transition from Zoom webinar to Zoom meeting format. And that will enable us hopefully to be more, have a more interpersonal feel and connection with all of you attending. And that towards the end of today's lecture, you can ask uh, with your own free will questions to our, our lecture to our uh, lecture today. Um, I'd like to mention also, again, if you're new to the series or if you've been with us since the beginning of 2021, we do ask that you hold your questions until the end of the speaker. And at that time, whether it's in the chat box or hopefully now orally, since we've gone to Zoom lecture uh, format, that you can just go ahead and ask as if you were in a lecture room. So again, uh, trying to get back to the good old days in, in, our, in our own way, still though via Zoom. We will ask though, if you're not asking a question towards the end of today's lecture, that you turn off your audio, that will cut down on any clutter or feedback, which will corrupt our, uh, quality of our, our speaker's presentation. And we reserve the right to mute us all if we need to, to protect that audio quality. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize once again, Linda Shackelford and Charles Shackelford, former co-owners of TLC Oklahoma City. They were uh, in that position of uh, independent owners of their garden centers for over 30 years. And what's really gratifying to me is they, as well as some other growers and retailers, helped put Oklahoma on the map. What do I mean by that? Well, Lyndon Charles, for at least the last 15 years, I meant to look that up before today, I don't have that memorized, but for well over a decade, they enjoy being in the top 100 retailers all those consecutive years. And so when you think about the size of our country and that we have growers and retailers here in Oklahoma that, that enjoy that top 100 uh, status. That's that's quite a feat. So congratulations again to Charles and Linda Shackelford. Congratulations though also, by the way, to current owners and management of TLC Oklahoma City, because they too are continuing that legacy of excellence by also being in the top 100 retailers. So it's just really gratifying to work with people of that caliber. It's just been uh, one of the highlights of my career. Um, having said that, I would like to then jump into our first speaker kicking off this year. And I met the speaker by chance at one of my societies during break. And who I met was Dr. Lynn Geddes, University of Florida, Fort Lauderdale. And Lynn, that's one of the best, hey Lynn, one of the best chance encounters I've ever had because she and I have been collaborating off and on ever since. So uh, I've got the best job in the world. I, I, I have great academics that I get to hang around with, but then I'm out in the field hanging around with uh, top-notch industry leaders. So uh, it's just, uh, it's been a, a thrill for me. I'm just starting year 33 of my career, and it's just uh, as much fun as, as day one, I can sincerely say that. So thank all of you for making it so much fun. Uh, Dr. Geddes uh, wears many hats, and we've been uh, pushing her bio and her her, uh, her her narrative of her talk since last year. So I won't read it verbatim, but certainly I will, will tell you, if you haven't seen it, she's here today to talk about inv invasion pathways and integrated management of invasive aquatic species. And again, Lynn is, I told you where she's affiliated with, but I didn't tell you she's an associate professor of agronomy. And what's really neat when I was looking at her degrees, she has degrees in horticulture and plant breeding and then lastly, for a PhD in plant genetics. So that's kind of like the perfect storm, if you will speak, academically speaking, where you put all that knowledge together and you'll see that it bore fruit when you start hearing the, the, the depth and the knowledge that she, that she carries in, in this uh, uh, invasive plant, aquatic plants arena. Uh, Lynn's work is focused, her research is focused on the biology and ecology of native and introduced aquatic and wetland plants and evaluation of control methods for managing invasive species. She also has statewide, as I've kind of alluded to, statewide extension responsibilities for aquatic weed control. Uh, she's authored or co-authored over 240 publications. 
2.40 publications, including more than 50 journal articles. If you haven't written a journal article, it, it's quite an adventure you need to put on your bucket list. It's a lot of work. You've got to please 25 people and their cousins before you get through the gauntlet of getting it published. So congratulations, Dr. Geddes, on that feat. And having said that, I think rather than eat up her time, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, welcome Dr. Lynn Geddes, University of Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale. Welcome to Stillwater, Lynn. The floor is yours. Thank you for that kind introduction, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. This is my first talk for 2022, so I'm excited about it. And uh, I appreciate the invitation from Dr. Snelly. And I'm looking forward to sharing a bunch of information with everybody today. I am going to kill my camera because I'm working from home, so I have consumer grade internet right now, and uh, the more I can do to make it stable, the better. So I'm going to turn off my camera and I'm going to start sharing my screen, and then we'll get going. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. And so, as Mike said, I'm going to be talking about invasion pathways and integrated management of invasive aquatic plants. And before I talk about the plants themselves, I want to talk a little bit about Florida's environment. Now, I, I know Florida is different from Oklahoma, but Florida is sort of the gateway for introduced species into the country. Uh, the Port of Miami is a huge source of introduced plants and animals. And so our waters in Florida are very highly invaded, uh, mostly due to our environment. So we're warm year round. We do get cold snaps, don't get me wrong, but not a lot of hard freezes. So our water tends to stay warm. It also tends to be fairly shallow. Most of our lakes are less than 15 or so feet deep. And so they're really easily invaded by aquatic plants once they actually get into that system. And finally, our waters tend to be pretty nutrient rich. So as a result of that sort of perfect storm, once a in introduced plant gets into Florida's waters, it tends to take over and become established very, very quickly. And so that begs the question, how exactly do they get here? We do have one instance where we think that hurricane winds were responsible for the introduction of an exotic or non-native aquatic plant in Florida, but that's pretty uncommon. We do have a plant that we're pretty sure came in via ballast water, and this is actually a plant that is a problem in Oklahoma as well, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. The sort of uh, sticking point for ballast water is ballast is usually salt water, and most of our freshwater plants are just not really well suited to a salt water environment. Uh, but the one we're going to talk about actually is pretty darn salt tolerant. We can have introduction via the uh, via. Um, I'm sorry. Here we go. I hope you guys can see my pointer, <laughs> uh, misidentification. And so this is a company on the internet and they're selling duckweed, which is a native plant. Duckweed's fine. It's used an awful lot in fish farming and aquariums, and it's usually not a problem. And so in this picture, these little bitty plants in here are indeed duckweed and they're fine. The problem is the larger plants that you see, these are common salvinia, that is an introduced invasive plant. So we've got either misidentification or contamination going on. Either way, we're getting introduction of an invasive plant. By far the most common way that aquatic and terrestrial species are introduced to the United States is via the nursery industry. And that's because everybody wants something new and exciting. And so that's how plants get here from some other place. 
And uh, this has been a common introduction vector for a very long time. And in fact, the USDA used to have a foreign plant introduction service where they would go around the world and they would find plants that had some desirable characteristic, either they were good for fiber or forage, or they were ornamental, or they could be used as windbreaks. And then those they would bring those back to the United States and encourage their planting in climate matched areas. And so these are the most common ways that invaders do get into the country. Once they're here, they can spread in a number of different ways. Uh, we do have mother nature sort of playing her part. So in the upper picture, uh, that's a little robin and that robin is eating Brazilian pepper fruits. Uh, luckily, you guys don't have Brazilian pepper in Oklahoma. Hopefully you never will, uh, but it may wait, make its way up to you eventually. So birds eat seeds, other animals eat seeds, they carry them around, they move them between systems and spread those invasive plants. We can also have aquatic plants that are already introduced that end up being moved as the result of hurricanes and tropical storms and just really big rain events when you have connected aquatic systems and one of those systems is infested with a particular weed. If you have lots and lots of water movement, that invasive species can actually be moved to a clean system as a result of that water movement. We can have hitchhiking as a mode for transporting and spreading invasive species. And so in this picture, this is a boat trailer. And so somebody is out on the water, they're having a good day, they're having a great time, but the system that they've launched in has invasive plants. We've got some water lettuce on here, there's some water hyacinth uh, and some other introduced species as well. The problem is if they don't clean those plants off of that trailer, when they put their boat back on and they go and launch in a new system, those plants can actually be spread to that new system as a result of hitchhiking on this trailer and other watercraft. <laughs> All right, we didn't actually catch this boy dumping this aquarium. It's a staged picture, uh, but this is how most submersed aquatic weeds are introduced into systems. Uh, most of our aquatic plants, at least the submersed ones, were introduced as aquarium plants, and so their use as oxygenators and to provide structure to aquariums. And so lots of people, instead of doing the right thing and disposing of those plants when they clean out their aquariums, just dump them in the closest body of water. Uh, the, a telltale sign this has happened is if you see a little pile of fluorescent gravel on the edge of the aquatic system, uh, it's a pretty good chance that, that somebody has dumped an aquarium there and that system now has aquatic weeds. We can have people who think they're doing the right thing. They're sharing and selling pretty plants. Uh, in this ad, this is a Craigslist ad from Doral, which is in South Florida. Uh, it's just a little bit south of where I'm based in Fort Lauderdale. And they're selling this nice little kidney pond. They're throwing in the plants, the fish and the fountain and the whole thing is 125 bucks. Now that is a fantastic deal because those ponds just by themselves uh, normally cost that much. But the catch is these floating plants in here are water hyacinth, which are bad, bad plants. We're gonna talk quite a bit about water hyacinth in a bit, but this person thinks they're doing a nice thing. They're selling somebody basically a full water garden setup, but they're helping to spread an invasive species in the process. But as with introduction, the most common way that introduced species are spread is via the, the big box and nursery trade. And that's because everybody wants something new and pretty and exciting. Well, so what? All plants are good, right? We love plants. Plants are great. They're the, the base of the food chain. Life on Earth could not exist without plants and aquatic plants in particular. But the problem is too many aquatic plants cause lots of problems. And this is water hyacinth again, because it's just our poster child for all things bad. We get dense growth of these aquatic plants and we can end up blocking the air water interface. 
Um, aquatic plants need oxygen. Fish need oxygen. So when you're blocking that interface, you end up with reduced dissolved oxygen levels in a system, and that's really bad. That also ends up shading out the submerged native plants that may be growing under these dense populations. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of submerged aquatic plants are well adapted to really low light conditions, but if there's virtually no light coming through, they can't photosynthesize and they end up dying. When you have dead plants and they're not producing oxygen and you've got low dissolved oxygen anyway from having a blocked air water interface, you end up with things like fish kills. These are bad. We don't like fish kills uh, and they can certainly result from overgrowth of aquatic plants. We can also have sort of catastrophic events that result from flooding when our canal systems are filled up with aquatic weeds. Um, they're, you know, Lake Okeechobee is um, sort of infamous for having some really serious flood actions uh, back in the, the early 1900s because the lake flooded and many, many people were killed as a result of that flooding. We have human hazards as well. Uh, there have been a number of cases of people becoming tangled in hydrilla and drowning. So hydrilla is a submersed weed. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but people do actually get trapped in it. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention that more when we get to hydrilla specifically, because there's a sort of a classic uh, ironic example of a drowning, but Aquatic plants also end up providing mosquito habitat, which is really detrimental to human health. So by now, I think we've established that plants are good, but all plants are not good. Overgrowth of aquatic plants is a really bad thing, and it can have serious impacts on the environment and on our use of aquatic systems. So what do you do? The cheapest, most effective way to prevent the damage caused by invasive aquatic plants is to keep them out in the first place. Uh, we have gotten much better at this. <laughs> we no longer have that foreign plant introduction service where we're going out and looking for non-native plants and bringing them here on purpose. But people are resourceful. They still will smuggle in plants. Um, and the inspectors can't catch everything. So unfortunately, we do still have introduced species get into the United States and uh, become established and cause problems. When that happens, we have to use all of the tools in our toolbox to manage these plants to keep them from becoming catastrophic problems. And we wanna do this in an integrated fashion. So we've got four main tools in our toolbox. We have cultural control methods, and for aquatic plants, this often involves um, water level manipulations. And so this is a drawdown, and a drawdown is, is just what it sounds like. It's a dewatering event where they remove all of the water from an aquatic system. And you see the little hat down here in the corner. Clearly, Indiana Jones was here. <laughs> Uh, drawdowns can be effective for managing some aquatic species, but you can't use them under all circumstances. So in Florida anyway, most of our waters are multi-use. So if you have a system that has lots of aquatic weeds and you want to do a drawdown, well, what are you going to do if that system is also used for fishing and recreation and irrigation and that sort of thing? Uh, it's going to be tough to actually get permission to draw that system down. You have to have somewhere to put that water as well. Uh, another trick is you have to stay drawn down or dewatered for usually six months or so to get decent control of submersed plants. And as with everything, there's a catch. Uh, it may be great for controlling submersed plants and, you know, preventing regrowth for a year and a half to two years, but drawdowns also spur germination of some aquatic plant seeds. And, and we'll talk about those uh, when we get to them. You can also manipulate nutrient levels a little bit. This can be helpful to suppress growth and that can be done using things like alum, which binds up phosphorus. We also have mechanical control as a tool in our toolbox. And uh, 
that has sort of a, a sketchy history for aquatic weed management. Uh, I'll talk about this quite a bit later, but that's kind of a funky looking machine, isn't it? And you, know, you can't just run out to John Deere and buy one of those. Harvesters are bespoke pretty much. Most of them are built on demand. They don't build these on spec and they are exceedingly expensive. Uh, little bitty ones that are eight feet long tend to be about $75,000 and they don't really uh, harvest that much. Another problem with doing mechanical harvesting like this is disposing of that plant material. Uh, most of the time you don't have somewhere close to offload it. So you have to actually put this material in a truck. Well, first you've got to get it back to the dock then you've got to load it in a truck, then you've got to take it to a landfill and pay tipping fees. It's important to remember that aquatic plants are usually around 95% water. So for every thousand pounds of plant material that you're throwing away, 950 pounds of that is actually water. When you're paying tipping fees on that, that adds up really quickly. Another issue with mechanical harvesting is uh, the problem of bycatch. And bycatch is essentially pulling up anything other than the plants you're trying to harvest. So when you're doing harvesting like this, you end up not only with say your water hyacinth, like in this picture, but you also end up with turtles <laughs> and fish. <laughs> uh, and that's a problem. Um, it's also not really efficient. Uh, it's a pretty slow process. A lot of harvesters can only do one or two acres of, a, of plant material a day. Um, so it has utility in some circumstances, but it's not something that's useful uh, for wide scale management. Another tool in our toolbox is biocontrol or the use of a biological organism uh, that co-evolved with the target weed and keeps it in check in its homeland. Uh, biocontrols are awesome. Um, <laughs> there are some hallmarks associated with these biocontrol agents. Uh, they have to be host specific. So that means they can't eat anything other than the target weed. And ideally they have to be able to form self-sustaining populations, meaning once you put out oh, a certain number of, of these critters, uh, you can walk away and they will maintain their own populations and come back year after year. This is a very expensive, long process. Uh, it can take up to 20 years to, uh, to get a biocontrol insect approved for release. You have to start by going to the home range for your target weed, finding whatever's eating them there and keeping them from, uh, from taking over in their native range. They have to be brought back to the United States and quarantined. They then have to be tested through feeding trials to make sure that they don't eat anything other than that target weed. Then they have to be able to rear them in the lab because if they're going to release these for weed control, they have to have pretty big numbers. Uh, despite that, we do have a number of uh, really great biocontrol insects and I'll talk about those as we go through this. Uh, but they, we don't have them for every weed by any stretch. <laughs> the final tool in the toolbox is chemical control. And this historically has been the use of herbicides in the aquatic weed world. And as with the other tools, we've got pluses and minuses to chemical control. There are herbicides that are, that are really selective. And so they can be used to manage just the target weed that you're interested in without causing lots of damage to your off-target plants. Uh, but they're not all that way. Some of our products are nonspecific, they're broad spectrum. And when that's the case, uh, you have to, the, the problem has to be serious enough that you're willing to accept some uh, off-target damage. And the, in, in Florida anyway, there's a, a pretty big stigma attached to chemical herbicide use. Um, and so there's a, a drive to find alternate methods. And so one of the things my lab has been doing is looking at uh, so-called natural products like delimonene and acetic acid or vinegar. And we've been evaluating how those affect both non-native and native aquatic plants. And um, 
I have a few plants in here that we've actually done research on. I'll talk about those when we get to them. On the surface, it sounds like a great idea, but um, I'm not going to give away the ending. We'll talk about them when we get to them. So using all of these tools together is called integrated pest management or integrated plant management. They basically mean the same thing. And the goal is to use all of these effectively. And in a perfect world, you end up with maintenance management. And so why not eradication? <laughs> Uh, we have found, unfortunately, that by the time a, an invasive species becomes established, it's virtually impossible to eradicate that species. That's why early detection is so important. So in Florida, our goal is maintenance management. We're keeping these population densities of these introduced plants down to a level that they're not interfering uh, at least too much with our use of the water or with mother nature's use. So we're trying to avoid habitat destruction and we're trying to just manage these plants to encourage a diverse habitat and uh, to keep our waterways clear. And so now we're actually going to talk about some plants. And we have plants in Florida that you don't have uh, problems with in Oklahoma. And you also have problems with some plants that aren't big issues in Florida. So for example, Oklahoma, you guys have purple loose strife. We don't really have that in Florida. It just doesn't get cold enough. Uh, you have problems with Eurasian water milfoil. We really don't in Florida. Uh, there's a little bit up in the very extreme panhandle, but most of Florida doesn't have problems with Eurasian water milfoil. And you've also got Brazilian water weed or Agiria densa. We have a little of that, but it just really doesn't like it in Florida that much. It's just a little bit too warm. So I'm gonna focus on the plants where we've got good overlap in Florida and Oklahoma. So we'll talk about some of the plants that cause both of our state's problems. I'll talk about different floating plants first, and then we'll talk about a few floating leaved species. Then we'll talk about a submersed plant, and then a few all-terrain or amphibious species. So the first plant is uh, sort of the OG aquatic weed uh, in Florida and probably nationally. Uh, this is water hyacinth. It first showed up in Florida in the 1880s. And if you look over here in this upper corner, uh, I zoom things in the way, let me try to get rid of it. There we go. Right here, we've got the boy with an aquarium. That tells you that this plant was intentionally introduced. Yay, us. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about its introduction history. Water hyacinth uh, was first given out, supposedly, at the Southern States Cotton Expo in New Orleans in the 1880s. Uh, the, the sort of urban legend is that these plants were given out as souvenirs, uh, but we really think that uh, they were probably kind of snitched from a pond uh, where the plants were being grown between this Southern States Cotton Expo and the French Quarter where the, the attendees for the expo were actually staying. The Florida story says that a Mrs. Fuller attended this expo and got little water hyacinth plants as door prizes. And she then brought them back to Florida and put them in her backyard garden, in her water garden. And they're really, really beautiful plants, as you can see here. But they also have exponential growth. You can go from one little water hyacinth plant to an acre of coverage in four months. And so very quickly, Mrs. Fuller's little water garden in her backyard became overgrown with water hyacinth. Now, <laughs> hindsight being what it is, uh, knowing what we know now, if, uh, if Mrs. Fuller knew better, she would have dried her extra plants out and thrown them away, but she didn't do that. She thought they were so pretty that she should share their beauty with the rest of Florida's residents. And so she put her extra plants in the closest body of water. That was the St. John's. So Mrs. Fuller lived in Palatka up here, right at the sort of headwaters of the St. John's. And so what? 
right? Well, <laughs> the problem is at that time, the St. John's was the major shipping lane through Florida. That's how we moved goods, produce, livestock, people, you name it. This was long before there were interstates. There weren't even cars at that point. And so within 10 years of her putting those extra plants into the mouth of the St. John's in Palatka, the St. John's was completely infested and overgrown with water hyacinth and it became impassable. And uh, we'll talk about what they tried to do <laughs> momentarily. So first let's talk a little bit about the plant itself. Water hyacinth's Latin name is Icornia crassipes. It's in the Ponideriaceae or the pickerel weed family. Uh, there's actually a move right now to try to um, change the genus on this from Icornia to Ponideria. They're, they're getting some pushback. Uh, I kind of like having it by, be Icornia, but we'll see how that plays out. You may see it listed either way. Water hyacinth is native to Brazil and South America, and it is a Florida noxious weed, meaning in Florida, you're not allowed to cultivate this, sell it, trade it, do anything to it other than to kill it. Water hyacinth is a floating plant and it can get up to three feet tall. Um, that's its growth above the surface of the water. The leaves are usually up to five inches across, sort of roundish in shape, although they do have a little sort of point on the tip or apex. They're leathery or rubbery in texture, and they're supported by spongy petioles or leaf stalks. And if you cut those uh, petioles in half, they look just like a kitchen sponge. All of those petioles are attached to the base of the plant, and then they're subtended by the roots, which are dark and feathery and just dangle in the water column. So these move around very easily on their own. Water hyacinth's claim to fame, of course, is its showy, showy purple flowers. Uh, it's a beautiful plant, uh, but this is a canal in South Florida in the central, sort of the central part of Southern Florida, and it's completely covered with water hyacinth. So let's look at some pictures of what this plant looks like. Here you can see those sort of rounded leaves. Uh, this one's folded, so you can't really tell it's round. It's got that little point on the apex or tip of the leaf, those spongy petioles, and those help the plant to uh, stay floating on the surface of the water. These are those dark feathery roots that subtend the plant and dangle down in the water column. And wow, so pretty, right? It is, it's a beautiful plant. There's, there's no arguing that, it's a beautiful plant. So Mrs. Fuller brought them into Florida. She introduced them into the St. John's. They took over the St. John's. And at that point, they had to start implementing some early control measures. And we actually have water hyacinth to thank for the development of the river, rivers and harbor Act, and that was uh, instituted in 1899. Congress authorized the Army Corps to spend up to $25,000 and to purchase crusher boats to try to get rid of these plants in the St. John's. And so why is the Army Corps involved? Well, the Army Corps is responsible for navigable waters in the United States. Since the St. John's was used for shipping, it definitely qualified as being a navigable water. Those crusher boats didn't do a lot. <laughs> 25 grand was not a lot of money. Uh, it, it was a lot of money then, don't get me wrong, but this was a huge, huge problem. So the River and Harbors Act was amended in 1902 and Army Corps was told to use any means necessary to <laughs> clear up these hyacinths. And they were allocated $50,000, uh, which again was a pretty significant chunk of money to do this. And that's great. They did actually manage to find um, some things that killed the water hyacinths, but unfortunately they also killed the cows that grazed those water hyacinths. This was bad. <laughs> this is unacceptable. So the River and Harbors Act was amended once again in 1905. And uh, they basically said, Congress said, stop the madness, uh, you're killing the cows. And so they looked at various feeding deterrents like sulfur and manure. 
and uh, those products either didn't keep the cows from eating the water hyacinths or they were so expensive that it just wasn't operationally feasible. So at that point, uh, they basically gave up. They did continue chemical testing, um, evaluating different herbicides, different chemicals. They looked at sulfuric acid, uh, all sorts of things. And they tested something like 40 different products and tried to find something that worked. But unfortunately, either it didn't work or the cows ate it and it killed the cows or it killed all the plants in the system. So they were no goes. So essentially for 40 or 50 years, the only game in town for water hyacinth management was mechanical control. This was really slow. It was really inefficient. And as a result, there were parts of the St. John's that were impassable uh, for a very, very, very long time. I mean, we just could not use the St. John's because the plants grow so fast uh, that the harvesting couldn't keep up with them. And it, I keep saying the St. John's because that's sort of our poster child, but many of the waters throughout Florida were also infested and couldn't be cleared. Finally, the, uh, the discovery of synthetic herbicides and 2,4-D in particular in the 40s um, are responsible for clearing up water hyacinths. So they found this, this new product and uh, it's 2,4-D and it's a synthetic auxin. It's an auxin mimic. So plants have produced a, a hormone that's very similar to 2,4-D and this makes the plants uh, essentially grow themselves to death. And because of that 2,4-D discovery, uh, we're now able to manage water hyacinth using chemical products. And it's uh, much more efficient, much less expensive, and much more effective than the mechanical harvesting that we were limited to until this product's discovery. So how do we actually manage hyacinth? What's in our toolbox? Drawdowns, not a great choice uh, for a couple of reasons. <laughs> so water hyacinth can actually tolerate being stranded on wet soil. Um, so drawdowns are normally used for submerged weed control. And remember I said there are some plants that uh, their seeds are spurred to germinate from drawdowns? Water hyacinth is one of those. So if you do a drawdown for say hydrilla control, you have to accept that once you bring the water back up, you're gonna have a huge flush of water hyacinth because all the water hyacinth seeds in that seed bank are gonna pop. Mechanical harvesting can be effective for water hyacinth management, but it's really slow. It's really expensive. You've got that bycatch problem. Uh, and if this was a really effective way to manage water hyacinth, uh, we wouldn't have had the St. John's and other aquatic systems in Florida filled up with plants for 50 years until 2,4-D was discovered. As far as biocontrol, we're very fortunate that we do have several really effective biological control agents that can be used for water hyacinth management. The one here on the left is a neocotina weevil. We actually have two different species of neocotina weevils. Uh, and the one on the right is sort of the new kid in town. This is Megamelis scutellaris, and it is a water hyacinth leaf hopper. So these insects are host specific. So the only thing they eat is water hyacinth. The neocotina weevils were introduced to Florida in the 70s, and they are they're essentially ubiquitous throughout Florida. Anywhere water hyacinth exists, there will be neocotina weevils. The megamelis critters, these are newer. Uh, we've only had these for about 10 years because you know it does take a long time to get them approved. And so we're still in the process of evaluating how well they work, but they seem to be really great too. Both of these types of critters um, cause a decent amount of damage to water hyacinth, but it's not effective to the point that it will kill the plants. And so as a result of that, the most common method used for water hyacinth management is chemical control or the use of herbicides. 
Uh, there are a number of different products that are, that are effective for water hyacinth management, but 2,4-D is sort of the tried and true standard. And my lab has actually done some work. And what we have found is that 2,4-D rates can actually be cut in half when those insects are present. And since those insects are present anywhere in Florida that water hyacinth is present, our applicators have been practicing IPM for 50 years. Well, no, not 50. Well, yeah, the 70s, good Lord, the 70s was 50 years ago. <laughs> wow. So yeah, we've been practicing IPM for a very long time uh, without realizing it. But this is one of our plants, because this is the most intensively managed floating plant in Florida, this and our next plant we'll talk about, there's interest in finding alternate ways to control water hyacinth. So this is one of the plants that we've been doing some work uh, looking at these natural or alternate products for weed control. And uh, we've got three plants that I'll be talking about that we've done these experiments on. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you the setup, basically how we did the research for water hyacinth. But that applies to all of the plants that, that I'll be talking about with uh, these products. So for these experiments that we did, uh, we used Diquat as sort of a standard synthetic chemical control treatment. We used three different rates ranging from a half a percent to 2%, and that was applied as Tribune. We looked at five different rates of acetic acid ranging from 5% up to 20%. And to give you a little bit of perspective, typical household vinegar is 3%. So uh, this is pretty spicy stuff. And our base material for this was green gobbler, 30% of vinegar, so it's 30% acetic acid. We also looked at delimonene. Uh, this is used as a cleaner. Uh, it's also sometimes included in surfactants to sort of improve penetration of products into plants. We looked at four different concentrations of this, ranging from 10 to 30%, and our base material material for this was 100% technical grade delimonene. We also looked at mixes of the acetic acid and delimonene in all of the concentrations that we evaluated individually for each of those. So we ended up with 20 different mixes. We also had an untreated control treatment. And for those, we were just spraying the plants with water. All of these treatments included a 1% by volume non-ionic surfactant uh, to help with penetration because, you know, these plants that are floating on the surface of the water tend to have really waxy surfaces. And so you have to add a surfactant to anything pretty much to get it to penetrate. For the experimental design, we conducted all of these experiments in 68 liter mesocosms, and I now I know that sounds fancy and important, uh, but I bet all of you have seen those uh, rope handle tubs you can get at you know the big box stores. That's what a mesocosm is. <laughs> we grew out our floating plants until we had about 80% coverage of the surface of the water, and we also looked at uh, emergent plants. And so in these experiments, the floating plants are the introduced exotic uh, non-native target species, and the emergent plants are desirable native species. The emergent plants we just grew on a greenhouse bench, and once the floating plants hit 80% coverage, we healed them into the mesocosm uh, with the floating plants. We had four reps or basically copies of each of our treatments. And these were all tested in pairs. So with the floating invasive species and a native emergent species. And that's because we were interested not only in efficacy or how well do these products kill our target weed, but we also needed to evaluate selectivity. And selectivity is just the product's ability to not cause um, excessive damage to our native plants. And so in a perfect world, we want something that has really good efficacy at a really low concentration and really selectivity or really good selectivity. So it doesn't cause damage at that same rate to our native plants. 
in all of these treatments, they were applied as a spray to wet treatment. And uh, here's my here's my crew. <laughs> this is Kyle, my biologist. This is Joey, my master's student. And Kyle is actually spraying one of these mesocosms. He's got guards up around the sides of that mesocosm. So that treatment only goes on those plants. Joey is timing him to make sure we put the same volume of product on each of these mesocosms. And so in the mesocosms here, this is actually when we were doing our first experiment and we've got water hyacinth and broadleaf sagittaria or arrowhead. So after these treatments were applied, we grew these plants out for eight weeks and then we did a destructive harvest. So we pulled the plants out and dried them down. And we also evaluated visual quality on them. So how badly were the plants dinged up? Uh, I'm not gonna talk about the visual quality, um, but the dry weights are actually more important. So we're gonna focus on that. And so what happened, uh, we're start, all of the graphs I'm going to show you are set up the same way. Uh, this happens to be the graph for the single products on water hyacinth. So that's our target plant. And we've got our untreated control over here on the far left. These are the plants that were just sprayed with water. This top heavy bar is the average dry weight produced by those untreated plants. This bar in the center is a 50% reduction from that untreated mean. And so in a perfect world uh, for good selectivity, we want our native plants to have numbers you know, above this bar. If we get a more than a 50% reduction in our native plants, that's not a good thing. This bottom bar is a 90% reduction from our untreated control. And this is what we consider to be uh, really good efficacy. So we want a 90% reduction in our target weed compared to our untreated control. <laughs> Clearly the only product out of these um, that actually did that, that had really good efficacy on water hyacinth was Diquat, our chemical synthetic standard. When we looked at our native plant, when we're looking for selectivity on our broadleaf Sagittaria, uh, very similar. So none of our single products, uh, our alternate products caused a lot of damage to plants, but the diquat killed them dead. So <laughs> not good. So then we looked at our mixes and now we're starting to, to see something a little bit different. And so in all of these graphs, we're ranging from 5% acetic acid up to 20% acetic acid. And that's mixed with 10, 15, 20, and 30% dilimonene. And so these are our mixes. And remember for good efficacy, we really want something below this 90% bar. Um, we can kind of, we're going to end up fudging a little bit just because there aren't a lot of good choices here. We're going to end up using 80% reduction as our good efficacy benchmark for this trial. But the good news is uh, these mixes did not cause a lot of damage to our broadleaf Sagittaria. So this is, this is actually good news. And we've got a few that sort of dinged up our native plants a little more than we'd like. Uh, but that's, you know, that's acceptable. So for our first set of studies with our water hyacinth and our broadleaf Sagittaria, we found that we had at least an 80% reduction in biomass when we used any of our diquat rates, which we sort of expected. And then when we used our 15% acetic acid with 20 or 30% dilimonene or 20% acetic acid with any dilimonene concentration. And just sort of as a reminder for selectivity, we're in, we're in pretty good shape here. So we've only got a couple uh, places, a couple treatments that caused our native broadleaf Sagittaria to have reductions of 50% or greater. So, so this is good news, right? Yay, excellent. <laughs> did we find efficacy? We did. We had treatments that, uh, that had substantial effects on the biomass of our target plant, our water hyacinth. 
And did we have selectivity? We did, because those treatments that were effective on water hyacinth didn't cause huge amounts of damage to our nice native broadleaf Sagittaria. So we're ready. We're, we're prepared to go forth and uh, use acetic acid and delimonene for weed control, right? No, not so fast. <laughs> Another part of this project was looking at the costs involved in using these alternate products. And so we're going to move into that stage. So for our cost comparison, Diquat, uh, Florida paid $35.50 a gallon for Tribune. Uh, these numbers are based on contract prices that uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission paid for products in 2018, which is when we first uh, developed the proposal for this research. So they were paying $35.50 a gallon for Diquat. The acetic acid as that 30% green gobbler comes in at about $8 a gallon if you buy it in bulk, so a 275 gallon tote. And the delimonene uh, used as 100% technical grade is $31.82 a gallon, and that's when you're buying four 55 gallon drums at a time. So you're buying uh, you know, pretty substantial amounts of the product. So if you just glance at this, you might go, well, yeah, the acetic acid and delimonene are both cheaper than diquat, but those are the prices for the concentrates. And we have to talk about the ready to use cost because these were all effective at different concentrations, right? So in 2018, because that's where these numbers are drawn from, uh, FWC spent $283,000 on Diquat, and that was to purchase 7,800, almost 7,900 gallons of Diquat. Now, if you'll recall, all three of the Diquat concentrations we evaluated were effective. They wiped out our uh, water hyacinth with no problem. And so to make things easy, we looked at the lowest concentration. So if that 7,900-ish gallons of Diquat was all mixed down to a half a percent concentration and then applied for aquatic weed control, that works out to just under 1.6 million gallons of ready-to-use product. That's that half a percent Diquat. And the ready-to-use cost would be 17 and a half cents or 17.75 cents per ready-to-use gallon. So our target ready to use gallons is 1.6 ish million. <laughs> That's a lot, right? And so remember our 30% acetic acid was eight bucks a gallon. Our delimonene was 31.82 a gallon. And we looked at a bunch of different concentrations. So once these were mixed down to the concentrations that we uh, evaluated in these trials, Remember, we looked at acetic acid at five different concentrations, ranging from 5% to 20%. The delimonene, we looked at concentrations ranging from 10% to 30%. So if we look at the actual cost comparison between our Diquat and our other products, with our Diquat, we're at about 18 cents a gallon, and we spent our $283,000 to make that 1.6-ish million gallons of ready-to-use product. So with our other stuff, <laughs> these are our natural products, remember. Uh, so these are some of the treatments that were effective or efficacious and selective. So they killed the water hyacinth pretty well, and they didn't cause too much damage to our broadleaf Sagittaria. The least expensive of those is 848 a gallon. And that's because we're using that 20% acetic acid. And the cost for that is 530 per ready to use gallon. The 10% delimonene, 318 per ready to use gallon. We've added those together. The final cost of that product per ready to use gallon is 848. And so if we multiply that by our 1.6-ish million gallons of ready-to-use product, wow, our cost comes in at uh, almost 13 and a half million 
dollars compared to 283,000 for Diquat. So, yikes, for water hyacinth management, we did find products that were uh, efficacious and selective, but those products cost 47 times more than our synthetic standard, which was Diquat. And that's not the end of the story, there's more. We've got this guy on his boat. He's putting this product out. If he switches to using these natural products, his labor costs are going up, his downtime is going up, and his PPE, who knows? So, so what do I mean by that? Why is the labor and downtime going up? Well, all right, so typical airboat can uh, usually has a hundred gallon tank. Now this pitcher does not, he's working out of a little tank but most airboats have a hundred gallon tank. And most times for doing floating or emergent weed control, our applicators are using a hundred gallons of mix per acre. So they're treating 10 acres a day. And that means they're burning through about a thousand gallons of ready to use product. So far so good. So they've got their hundred gallon tank. If they're using that diquat, that synthetic standard, they're putting it out at a half a percent. That means each 100 gallon tank is going to need to have a half a gallon, 64 ounces of Diquat added to it. For using those natural products, the least expensive of those was the 20% acetic acid and the 10% delimonene. In order to hit those concentrations in a 100 gallon tank, they're gonna need 67 gallons of that 30% green gobbler acetic acid and 10 gallons of that 100% delimonene. That's a lot. <laughs> Normally, what these guys do is they, um, you know, they draw the water that they're mixing with from the system they're treating. And so if they have a full day that they're going to be out and they're going to treat with Diquat, they can leave in the morning with two jugs, you know, each of them are two and a half gallons. They can go out with two jugs of Diquat and they're out all day. They're good to go. Using these natural products in order to make the same amount of ready to use mix, they're gonna need 670 gallons of that 30% green gobbler and 100 gallons of delimonene. So first, take a look at this boat again. Where are they gonna put that? That's a lot of material. I mean, combined, we're talking 770 gallons of product. Uh, and the weight on that is gonna be probably close to 8,000 pounds once you factor in you know, the, the containers and that sort of thing. They can't put that much weight on these boats. <laughs> They'll sink. <laughs> so that means every time they spray out a tank, they burn through a hundred gallon tank, they're gonna have to go back to the dock and pick up another 67 gallons of this 30% green gobbler, another 10 gallons of that 100% delimonene. And so that's gonna be a huge amount of downtime because you know, if these plants would just cooperate and grow right near the dock and only right near the dock, it wouldn't be that big a deal. But Lake Okeechobee is 448,000 acres. Uh, these guys may have to go a mile before they get to an area where they're actually treating plants. And so if they go through their 100 gallon tank uh, and have to go a mile back to the dock, that's gonna take a long time. So their downtime is greatly increased. Their efficiency tank tanks. Um, and then another thing is, you know, these products are not labeled for aquatic use. Uh, we really don't have a good idea of the PPE that would be required to keep applicators safe when they're using these products. Uh, I, I personally, <laughs> when we were doing these greenhouse experiments, and they are still in progress, we've got uh, two more species we're working on. Uh, I'm the mixer and loader because since we don't really have good PPE, uh, information about these. I don't necessarily want the people in my lab handling these base materials. I can tell you I'm much happier handling Diquat than I am 30% acetic acid, 
that will burn your your hair off of your arms. Uh, it is harsh. It is heavy duty stuff. But so in order to have this uh, actually be useful operationally, we'd have to find a way to figure out what PPE is required. So that's the story on the natural products. And as I mentioned, we, we have evaluated these on a couple other species that I'll talk about. And so I'll just talk about the results when we get to those. But so for now, we shall move on. So our next plant is water lettuce. This is also a floating plant, uh, also thought to be an intentional introduction as a water garden plant. And it's uh, been in Florida at least since the 1750s. Water hyacinth's Latin name is Pisteus stratiotes. It's a South American native, uh, also native to Africa, and there are rumblings that it might be native to the southeastern United States. Uh, that's because they did find evidence in fossil records from, oh, I think 25,000 years ago or so. Uh, they found pollen from what looked like water lettuce. Uh, but then it disappeared for a very, very long time. Uh, there were no records of water lettuce in Florida up until it was found in a floral survey in the 1750s. The assumption for, for most researchers is that it was introduced, perhaps it was here before, but it was extirpated, and then it was reintroduced as a water garden ornamental. And the logic for that is it's related to biocontrol. And the, the party line is that if water lettuce was truly native to Florida, it's very likely that there would be something in Florida that was co-evolved to feed strictly on water lettuce and be host specific to keep it in check in its native range if it was in its native range. So most of us uh, don't buy the argument that it's native because it was uh, present in fossil records, we believe that it was reintroduced as an ornamental. Water lettuce is a Florida class two prohibited aquatic plant. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means out in the field uh, and for the typical person in Florida, you can't do anything to water lettuce other than to kill it. However, Certain nurseries are allowed to grow water lettuce and ship it out of state, and that is because it is not cold hardy and it will die during a freeze. Those nurseries have to have a permit, and again, they can only be sold out of Florida and only to states that uh, don't prohibit this plant. Water lettuce can get up to two feet wide, so it's a pretty substantial floating plant, and as you can see, it makes a very, very dense population. The individual leaves are up to a foot or so in length. Uh, they tend to have a scalloped margin and they're thick, dull green and sessile, meaning they lack a petiole or leaf stalk. All of those leaves are just attached together at the base. The roots are light and feathery and water lettuce has inconspicuous flowers. So the assumption is this was introduced as a foliage ornamental for water gardens. So they're cute when they're small, right? I mean, that's my hand, I'm not a giant. <laughs> we got a little bitty plant. So this little guy's got what, oh, five, six leaves. So it's small, it's already making babies. That's what's going on over here to the left. It's pupping, even though it's tiny. And there's another pup coming off back here. So um, extremely productive, reproduces mostly by vegetative means just like water hyacinth. Here's a mature plant, so they do get quite large. And uh, you can see it's a little bit beaten up and there are generalists in Florida that feed on water lettuce, but uh, nothing host specific. This is that inconspicuous flower. So it's a spathe and spadix arrangement, uh, very typical of everything in the Aeraceae family, but nothing that's gonna jump out at you. So on this, on this plant, this is the spathe and spadix uh, inflorescence right in the middle of it. So it's not showy at all, uh, grown as a foliage floating ornamental. So what's in our toolbox? Well, drawdowns, not a great option for the same reason that they don't work well for water hyacinth. 
stranded water lettuce plants will be happy as long as their roots are wet so they can survive being on wet soil and the seeds are spurred to germinate from a drawdown. We don't have any biocontrol critters. Uh, there was actually uh, some fairly decent progress being made on some insects that we brought in from, uh, I think, South America. And we're doing trials on, when I say we, I mean the, the USDA's Invasive Plant Research Lab, which I kind of partner with. They were doing some work on um, weevils or critters that they had brought in for water lettuce control. And once that paper came out that said, well, yeah, it was in the fossil record, so we think it's native, their funding for that project ground to a halt because we don't spend money to try to find things that kill native plants. <laughs> so that's unfortunate. Um, so no biocontrol options. Mechanical harvesting can be useful, but then again, you've got the problem of disposal, bycatch, um, low efficiency. And so the most common means to manage water lettuce is the use of chemical control or herbicides. So we, um, this is another one of the plants that we tested these natural products from. And I'm not going to run through the whole experimental design again because we already went over that. I'm just going to jump right to our results. So we evaluated water lettuce with pickerel weed as our native plant. And in water lettuce, we got a couple delimonene treatments that did really great. So again, our diquat killed the plants dead. Uh, most of the treatments didn't do much, but our two highest rates of delimonene were awesome. We had good selectivity on our native pickerel weed. So we got a little bit of a damage here, you know, a little below 50%. That's still probably acceptable though. Once we threw our mixes in, wow, just about everything uh, knocked water lettuce back on its heels. Uh, they did not like that combination of acetic acid and delimonene. And we still had sort of acceptable levels of selectivity on our pickerel weed. You know, we do really like to, uh, to have less than a 50% reduction. We'd really rather have those bars up in this area, but this is still, this is still pretty acceptable. So for our summary on the water lettuce natural treatments, we had 80% reductions in biomass when we had pretty much any diquat treatment. Uh, any treatment that was of delimonene alone, greater than 20%. And then our 5% acetic acid with 15 or 20% delimonene. Then our higher rate of uh, acetic acid with almost any rate of delimonene, and then basically more than 10% acetic acid and any amount of delimonene killed it quite nicely. And just as a reminder, there's our selectivity on pickerel weeds. So we did get some, some knockback, maybe a little more than we'd like, but still acceptable. So for our cost comparisons, uh, very similar, well, exactly the same as the water hyacinth. And recall that our diquat was 35.50 a gallon and our ready to use half a percent diquat mix was just under 18 cents a gallon. Our volume calculation is the same as it was for water hyacinth. And that's because when FWC develops these plans for or develops, does the reporting for, um, for their treating for the year, they group water lettuce and water hyacinth together and just call them floating plants. And so the, uh, the amount of ready to use mix is the same for water lettuce as it was for water hyacinth. So for our cost comparisons, we've got our diquat at $283,000. And for our natural products, the least expensive that was efficacious and selective came in at 583 per ready to use gallon. That was our 10% acetic acid, 10% delimonene mix. With that 1.6 million gallons of ready to use mix, our price goes from 283,000 for diquat to over 9 million for our natural 
product. Darn it. <laughs> so again, we've got a 32 times increase. Sorry about that. 30 time, 32 time increase in our product cost. And we still have that problem of our increased labor, increased downtime, reduced efficiency, and unknown PPE ramifications. So we were able to find a product that was efficacious and selective, but it'd be really, really insanely expensive. Our next plant is giant salvinia, also called cariba weed. Uh, this was first found in the wild in Florida in the 1990s, and it was thought to have escaped as um, a former aquarium plant. What a surprise, right? Giant salvinia's Latin name is salvinia molesta. It's in the salviniaceae family, and it is a true fern. It's native to Brazil and it is a federal noxious weed, meaning it's bad everywhere in the country. It has fronds that look like modified leaves. They're up to four centimeters across. The upper fronds are round to oval in shape and they're joined in pairs. They're covered with uh, stiff erect hairs that are joined at the tip and look sort of like egg beaters. The lower fronds dangle in the root column and they look like roots. So they're not true roots, uh, but they look like it. Those are just the modified lower fronds. So here we have some giant salvinia, a highly water repellent, as you can see. And for scale, definitely smaller than the water hyacinth and water lettuce, um, but still pretty substantial for a floating aquatic plant. These are those hairs that I mentioned. And uh, it's important to, to recognize that as an identifying characteristic because there's another species of salvinia, it's called common salvinia, that's very similar in appearance, but much less aggressive in its growth. Don't get me wrong, still invasive, <laughs> just not as bad as a giant salvinia. Common salvinia, uh, the, the hairs are forked at the tip. They're not joined in the egg beaters like giant salvinia is. And so that's how you can tell them apart. So these float right on the surface of the water with the uh, modified fronds that look like roots dangling down in the water column. So, oops, look at that. I gave it away. My darn red X showed up too fast. <laughs> Drawdown's not a great option for giant salvinia. Uh, the spores are pretty tolerant of dry downs, so they will pop and germinate and become plants once the water comes back up. Mechanical harvesting is an option, but it has those drawbacks that I've already mentioned for water hyacinth and water lettuce. There is a pretty decent uh, biocontrol critter, the salvinia weevil. It's not really broadly distributed though, uh, so but it can be useful. In Florida, the most common way giant salvinia is controlled is through chemicals or the use of herbicides. And this is another plant that we evaluated the acetic acid and the limonene on. So first I have to mention that the giant salvinia is not yet a huge problem in Florida. And so it's not something that FWC actually treated in 2018. And since that's where we drew our base numbers for the proposal, um, we decided to look at its little brother, common salvinia instead. So our target in this set of experiments was common salvinia and our non-target native plant was cattail. So again, just like the other plants, Diquat wiped everything out. We did get some decent uh, efficacy from our higher rates of delimonene. With our cattail looking for selectivity, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> lots of stuff uh, caused damage to cattail. I mean, all of these natural products reduced the biomass by at least 50%, which isn't ideal. Some of them completely wiped the plants out. When we looked at our mixes, wow. So we basically have one mix, our 5% acetic acid and 10% delimonene. 
that didn't do anything to the common salvinia, but every other mix wiped the plants out. Unfortunately, it did the same thing to cattail. <laughs> So that's not good. Uh, we have uh, we have great efficacy up here, but we've got terrible selectivity down here. So we can't treat salvinia with these mixes without causing lots and lots of damage to our cattail as well. So that's not a great thing. So to summarize those treatments, we had at least an 80% reduction in biomass with almost everything except acetic acid, which didn't really seem to bother the salvinia too much. But we also had really poor selectivity. Um, the only treatments where we had good efficacy and acceptable selectivity were the 15 and 20% delimonene treatments. So in our Salvinia over here, we had a 90% or greater reduction. We completely wiped it out with the 20%. And in our selectivity with our cattail, yeah, we had more than 50% reduction, but this is probably as good as it's going to get. So what does that look like in cost? First of all, there's no point even looking at acetic acid because we go back one. The acetic acid killed, pretty much killed, uh, all of our cattail. I mean, the only one that didn't really wipe out the cattail didn't really do anything to the salvinia either. So there's no point looking at the acetic acid by itself. No point looking at the mixes because the mixes all had really terrible selectivity. So we're not even going to talk about acetic acid costs on this one. We're just focusing on the delimonene. Our diquat was still our standard synthetic control. And in 2018, they made almost 4,000 gallons of ready to use mix of a half a percent diquat to treat salvinia. So that's our, our target ready to use volume. So with diquat, we're looking at $679 in product cost to make that 3,800 gallons of half a percent ready to use mix. With our delimonene, the 15% delimonene was effective. It was the cheapest treatment because uh, the only other one that was effective and selective was 20% delimonene, which would cost more. Uh, we're looking at 477 per gallon uh, for ready to use mix. So our treatment product cost goes from $679 on Diquat up to over $18,000 with the delimonene. Yikes. So we've got a 27 time increase in our product cost. And again, we've got that uh, problem of high labor, high downtime, low efficiency and unknown PPE requirements. My goodness. So the take home message on these natural products, because this is the last plant I'll talk about that, uh, that we have evaluations finished. Some of these combinations do work as well as synthetic herbicides. However, the materials are much more expensive. The labor and downtime is greatly increased. And that's because of the weight of these products the space that you'd need to have on the boat to actually carry that product out with you, and then the trips needed to reload that tank. So they may have utility in some areas, uh, but the problem is right now, and one of the several problems, they're not labeled for aquatic use. Uh, we don't really know much about the toxicity of these products, and we do not know what types of PPE would be required. <clears throat> We do still have a few other species that we're evaluating with these natural products. And that actually leads us into our next plant, Crested Floating Heart. Uh, we still have trials ongoing with this one, so I won't be able to tell you anything about those natural products on Crested Floating Heart because uh, the plants are still in the process of dying after being treated. So Crested Floating Heart was first found in the wilds in Florida in 1990, in the 1990s, and it is a water garden escape. Its Latin name is Nymphoides cristata. It's in the Menyanthaceae or the bog bean family. It's an Asian native and it's a Florida noxious weed. So you can't do anything to it other than to kill it. 
The leaves are up to about six inches across. They're chordate or heart shaped, hence the floating heart part of its common name. They usually have dark red markings or variegations on the surface of the leaves and the leaves are smooth. It has really pretty <laughs> white flowers. Usually they have five petals and they have a ridge or crest down the center of each petal, which is where the crested part of its uh, common name comes from. They produce a spiky ramet, which is a vegetative reproductive structure. Uh, I'll show you those in just a minute. And that seems to be the primary means for reproduction in this species. It's so pretty, isn't it? <laughs> it's a beautiful plant. Uh, there's no arguing that this is a good looking plant. I mean, who wouldn't want these in a water garden? We've got those lovely chordate or heart shaped leaves with the red markings. We have that really pretty perky white flower with the ridge down the center. Uh, we do have a native species in Florida, um, banana lily, that is pretty similar in appearance, but has rounded solid green leaves and it has flat white petals. Uh, but the crests or ridges down the center of these petals is uh, very diagnostic and very characteristic of this species. This is that ramet that I mentioned. So that looks like it would hurt if you stepped on it, but it's actually pretty soft and flexible. These are produced at uh, virtually every place that the petiole joins to the leaf. And I say every, almost every place because uh, <laughs> these are really productive plants. Um, we did some research with Crested Floating Heart a number of years ago and found that if we started with one plant and it was happy and well fertilized, if we grew that plant out for six months, it would produce 500 or so of those ramets from one plant. About half of those or so will actually sprout as long as they're not covered by substrate because basically the, the leaf and the petiole will rot. These ramets drop to the bottom of the system. They sprout and become new plants. And as a result of that heavy ramet production, you can go from one plant to something like 30,000 in, in about a two year period. Um, that's all theoretical. That was just some math we did. But if these plants even reach 10% of that potential, that is a huge, huge number of plants. So early detection, rapid response is really important on crested floating heart. As far as tools in the toolbox, drawdowns are useless. Uh, the ramets will last for a long time on moist soil. They do not like to completely dry out, so that's something, but they'll be perfectly happy growing on moist soil. Mechanical harvesting is not a great option. These tend to root from leaf fragments <laughs> and harvesting makes fragments uh, and harvesting also does nothing for the, the ramets that ac accumulate on the bottom of a system. There are no biocontrol bio critters known for crested floating heart, at least at this point. Uh, I do think that the USDA has a couple species that they're looking at, but it's pretty early in development. And so the most common method used for management of crested floating heart is the use of herbicides. Our next plant is a close relative. Uh, we have yellow floating heart, also found in the wild in Florida in the 1990s, and also a water garden escape. Yellow floating heart's Latin name is Nymphoides peltata. It's still in the Menanthaceae or bog bean family with its brother crested floating heart. It's an Asian native and it is also a Florida noxious weed. The leaves on floating on yellow floating heart are not heart shaped like those of crested floating heart. They tend to be rounder as opposed to that chordate or heart shape. The underside of the leaves uh, is often purple and the leaves have sort of a scalloped or roughly margin. The flowers have flat, papery yellow petals, uh, almost always five petals. We have not seen any evidence of ramet production in this species, but it does make lots and lots and lots of seeds. So here we have some pretty yellow floating hearts, very cheerful. <laughs> 
so the flower of yellow floating heart is the largest of the floating heart flowers. This can come in at two inches or so across, which is pretty substantial. Down here, this is where you would normally see ramet production, uh, right about in that area, but there's nothing going on there. So we don't think this makes ramets. It does root from fragments and you can see uh, the production of adventitious roots in just some of the nodes of this plant. And these are those fat little seed capsules. So they do make lots and lots and lots of seeds. So how do we control it? Eh, drawdown's not a great choice. <laughs> um, these are quite happy just sitting on moist soil. And when we do a drawdown, it's almost impossible to get the soil completely dry. So there's usually enough uh, residual moisture that plants like this are perfectly happy. No biocontrol critters, unfortunately. Uh, mechanical harvesting can be used, but it's really not a great choice because of the fragmentation. Um, it can spread this plant really, really easily. And so as with crested floating heart, the most common way to control yellow floating heart is via the use of herbicides. Next, we'll move on to our submersed plant, hydrilla. Uh, this is the other OG aquatic weed in Florida. <laughs> uh, first uh, introduced to Florida in the 1950s, and this was an intentional introduction as a water garden and aquarium plant. Uh, it was first introduced, as I said, intentionally by Otto Beld, who had a nursery in Missouri. He brought this into the country sometime in uh, the early 1950s and then sent plants to his friend Albert Greenberg in Florida who had an aquatic nursery. Mr. Greenberg really didn't want to mess with these plants too much so uh, these are these are how they were sent. And this is a picture from one of my old friends Don Schmitz. They were sent in this uh, wet wrapped up newspaper. So Mr. Greenberg wasn't really interested in doing anything with these plants. He actually was perfectly happy growing his Brazilian water weed and didn't really see any use for these. And uh, they called this plant a star of India vine at first because it was Indian in origin and kind of has that star shaped cross section. But either way, Mr. Greenberg didn't really want anything to do with it. So he pawned it off on his uh, operations manager at his nursery, Mr. Jennings. Mr. Jennings went, eh, I'm just gonna put these in the canal behind the, the nursery. I don't, I don't have time to deal with them. He tossed them back there and uh, happened to need plants. Oh, a year or so later because their Brazilian waterweed stock was low and he went back to the canal to see what was going on and found that his hydrilla was just going gangbusters. <laughs> so they thought that was great. Uh, they also ended up having it in a nursery in southeast Miami by 1955 and uh, yeah, it pro proliferated from there. When it first started causing problems in Florida, the original assumption was that this was our native Elodea canadensis. Um, but it, it has characteristics that Elodea doesn't. One of those things is, one of those characteristics is hydrilla makes tubers and turions, which we'll talk about later. Uh, and Egeria does not. And so two USDA researchers, Bob Blackburn and Oh, Weldon, I, Lyle Weldon uh, got samples of this plant and sent it out and finally got it correctly ID'd as hydrilla. By the time they figured out that this was not that native uh, Elodea, the, the horse was out of the barn. We had statewide serious infestations and uh, it was too late to do anything like early detection or rapid response. If you'll recall, when we first started this presentation, I mentioned uh, drowning in hydrilla. Lyle Weldon actually drowned when he became tangled in hydrilla. He was scouting, looking for sites to do research on how to manage this nasty plant. And he got trapped in the plant and drowned. Uh, so it ended up killing him which is a very sad story. He was a great guy. I didn't know him personally, but I know people who knew him. So it's a pretty big loss. 
So hydrilla's Latin name is Hydrilla verticillata. It's in the Hydrocaridaceae or frog bit family. It has multiple points of origin. Uh, there are populations in Korea and in India where it's thought to be native. In Florida, we have the dioecious sort of female <laughs> type of hydrilla. So there are two different biotypes of hydrilla. There's monoecious and dioecious. Monoecious produce separate male and female flowers on the same plant. Dioecious plants produce either male or female flowers. Now the terminology is not correct, but I'm, I'm simplifying it because everybody knows male and female, and I don't want to confuse things with pistillate and staminate. So in Florida, we only have the dioecious uh, type of hydrilla, and all of our hydrilla is female. So the monoecious, I'm not sure if Oklahoma has monoecious or dioecious, but I kind of think you probably have the dioecious as well. But the end result is dioecious hydrilla doesn't produce any seeds because there's no pollen source. Hydrilla is a federally listed noxious weed, so bad everywhere. It will grow in water as deep as 25 feet, so it's, a, it's pretty tolerant of deep water. The leaves are strap shaped up to about a half inch in length and they have coarse serrations or saw teeth along the margins. They're attached in a verticillate fashion, so four to eight whorled leaves at each node. It's a rooted plant, so it doesn't float around like our water hyacinth and our water lettuce or salvinia did. And it produces tubers and turions, which are vegetative structures. I'll show you those in just a minute. It produces a small white flower, sort of wimpy looking up to about a quarter inch across and it's on a long peduncle or flower stalk. So here we have a lovely bouquet of hydrilla. It's so pretty, you can see why you'd want this in an aquarium. This is where that Star of India vine name came from and you can actually see those serrations on the margins. These are the flowers, uh, not showy at all, and again, not functional, so no pollen. These are the tubers and turions. So the tubers are the white sort of potato-like structures. Those are produced in the soil. The green sort of pine cone-like structures are produced in the leaf axles. So if this plant was producing turions, there'd be one right about there. But since this plant does not produce seeds, uh, these are the mechanisms that it uses to recover after herbicide treatment or a drawdown or any other sort of insult that damages its population. So what's in the toolbox? Yeah, this is one drawdowns work on. <laughs> you can get a year and a half to two years of control of hydrilla as a result of a drawdown. Uh, you can mechanically harvest hydrilla, but you know bycatch is a problem and essentially you're cutting the grass. Uh, the only sort of really, really effective biocontrol agent for hydrilla isn't really a true biocontrol agent. Uh, this is the triploid grass carp. It is in itself an invasive introduced species. It is not host specific. Um, when it was introduced, they really didn't have the sort of parameters for a good biocontrol agent nailed down. And so they brought it in to control hydrilla and found out that it actually eats almost all other submerged aquatic plants. Uh, since it's an invasive species, you have to have a permit to possess it in Florida. You have to make sure it's contained uh, and they challenging to use for hydrilla control, but they are an option but by far the most common method used for hydrilla management in Florida is herbicides. Now there is a, a fairly well-developed integrated management program for hydrilla. It's the hydrilla ramp or risk avoidance and mitigation project. And this integrates a herbicide, an insect and a fungus. So the herbicide is amazomox and at low concentrations, amazomox just causes lots of branching in hydrilla that causes lots of tips. Then Cricotopus libidus uh, is a tip mining midge that then comes in and damages all of those tips that are produced by the amazomox branching. 
and then finally, this Mycoleptodiscus terrestris fungus, which is the native fungus, attacks those damaged tips. This works really well in the lab on a small scale. It's a great theory, uh, but has not been successful operationally. So that's unfortunate. <laughs> Our next plant is alligator weed, uh, first found in Florida's waters in the 1890s. And gosh, look at this. For once, we have something besides the kid with the aquarium up here. Uh, we've, got a, we've got a hitchhiker. And it's actually thought that alligator weed was introduced in ballast water. And we do know that it's pretty salt tolerant because I had a PhD student work on that. And he found that salt water or that uh, alligator weed can tolerate up to 20 parts per thousand <laughs> uh, salinity, which is really high. It's uh, about two thirds the strength of seawater. So it's a pretty salt tolerant. Alligator weed's Latin name is Alternanthera phylloxeroides. It's in the Amaranthaceae family and it is a South American native. This is another Florida noxious weed, so we can't do anything to it other than kill it. Uh, when it's out of water, it can get up to about a foot tall. And when it's growing underwater, it can grow in water about six feet deep. The leaves are simple, up to four inches or so in length. They are elliptic to lanceolate or sword shaped. Uh, they have smooth margins. Those leaves are attached opposite one another in pairs. And the stems of alligator weed or are hollow. Uh, they can have a really wide opening, especially if the plant's growing in deep water. And it's thought that that's to both move air through the plant and to help the stems stay afloat. It produces a small white flower on a peduncle or flower stalk. So here is submersed alligator weed. We don't actually see it that way very much. Uh, it's much commoner on uh, sort of banks and shorelines. This is that opposite leaf attachment. And this is that hollow stem that I mentioned. And you'll note here, we've got the formation of adventitious roots at this node. So that tells you that this uh, will root very easily from fragments. Here's that little white flower, uh, not very showy at all. And uh, another sort of more evidence that this was an accidental introduction because this plant's not really attractive enough that somebody would bring it in on purpose. So what's in our toolbox? Well, drawdowns are useless for amphibious plants. Uh, they don't need lots of water to be perfectly happy. Mechanical harvesting can be somewhat useful uh, if you're mowing, but that creates fragments. Uh, so that can be a challenge. Herbicides are used for alligator weed management, but surprisingly, by far the most common method for alligator weed control is the use of this little guy, the alligator weed flea beetle. Uh, very, very effective. <laughs> and in fact, uh, most times we're not even treating alligator weed with herbicides anymore because this little guy is so effective that we don't need to. Uh, it's such an effective control method that um, even though it doesn't overwinter out of Florida, the Army Corps of Engineers actually has a program where they will collect these critters and ship them to other states that are not Florida uh, in spring if they're requested to repopulate the alligator weed beetle populations in other areas because they do such a good job of weed control uh, that they're sort of willing to overlook the fact that they don't make self-sustaining populations elsewhere. Our next plant is wild taro, uh, first introduced to Florida in 1910, intentionally, <laughs> yay, uh, as an alternative to potato crops. Its Latin name is Colocasia esculenta. It's in the Araceae family, along with that water lettuce, native to Southeast Asia and India. And this is a Florida Invasive Species Council uh, category one plant, meaning that it is disrupting habitats, uh, but it is not prohibited by the state. In fact, this is routinely sold in Florida nurseries because it's perfectly happy as an upland ornamental as well. It's a monocot. Uh, it can get up to eight feet tall, so it's a pretty substantial plant. 
individual leaves are simple, up to two feet in length, and they're sagittate or sort of arrowhead shaped. The petiole attachment is peltate, meaning it attaches toward the center of the leaf instead of at one end, like you see on most leaves. The petioles or leaf stalks are up to four feet in length, and they're attached at the base of the plant. Like everything in the Aeraceae, it has that spathe and spadix inflorescence. So <laughs> fairly decent sized plant. I mean, this is a this is a toddler, probably three or four years old, but uh, that's still a big plant. They grow perfectly well out of water. And if you look right about there where the, the point, the veins emanate out from, that's where the petiole attaches. So that's that peltate attachment. Uh, very ornamental, grown quite a bit in upland landscapes. As far as what's in the toolbox, drawdowns are useless. They don't need water. Mechanical harvesting and mowing can be done, but these have calcium oxalate crystals and they can cause irritation. So um, whoever's mowing them has to be careful to keep the plant sap off of themselves. There are no biocontrol critters. And so we're using herbicides to manage wild taro. Our last plant is parrot feather. Uh, this is an intentional introduction, first brought into New Jersey in the 1890s. Parrot feather's Latin name is Myriophyllum aquaticum. It's in the Halorigaceae family. It's a South American native, uh, and it's not listed by Florida, so it's not prohibited. And in fact, like wild taro, it is sold in <laughs> Florida nurseries. Uh, this can get up to eight inches tall out of water, and it also grows submersed, although you don't see it that way so much. The leaves are highly dissected, up to an inch or so in length. The emergent leaves are sort of rubbery and feathery, where the submersed leaves are thinner and finer. Leaf arrangement is verticillate, with four to six leaves at each node. And the tip of parrot feather is always erect. So even if the plant is submersed, you will normally have at least the tip of the plant floating on the surface of the water and sort of poking up. It does flower, but those flowers are inconspicuous, not showy at all. So here's that erect tip that I mentioned. And if you were to actually pull that tip underwater, hold it there and then release it, it'll spring back up and be perfectly dry, which is I, which I think is one of the coolest things in the world. And that's because it is very waxy. Uh, those are the emergent leaves, highly water repellent. Here are those little inconspicuous flowers. And these are the submersed leaves. So kind of similar in structure to the emergent uh, growth, but finer and thinner and fluffier. So how do we kill it? Drawdowns are useless. <laughs> Mechanical harvesting or mowing can fragment it and it roots quite easily from fragments. So it can be used, but with caution. No biocontrol critters available. So once again, we're looking at herbicides as being the number one game in town. So as far as the, uh, the importance of different vectors for aquatic weeds, both in Florida and in Oklahoma, let's see, the plants we've talked about, we got water lettuce, water hyacinth, salvinia, crested floating heart, yellow floating heart, hydrilla, wild taro, and parrot feather. Those were all intentional introductions. <laughs> we brought them here on purpose. <laughs> our other one, our sort of odd kid out there is alligator weed, thought to have come in uh, as a result of ballast water introduction. So the take home message on this is we've met the enemy. He's us, grow native plants. We don't need these uh, exotic introduced ones. We've got plenty of decent native plants, although they can break bad too. <laughs> and I bet Dr. Snelly will tell you about that at some point. And that's what I have for you. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope I've left enough time for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Lynn, that's great. I want to open it up for questions. And Donna, help me if we can't get people unmuted that want to speak. Um, if not, throw something in the chat box and get my attention. Otherwise, feel free to jump out right now if you're unmuted. I'm looking here. 
So it looks like Marley has her hand up. Um, Marley, I'm going to try to unmute you. I don't know if that's helping. Can okay, yeah, you should be unmuted. Hi, Marley. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dr. Geddes, for a very lively and interesting <laughs> presentation. Um, your, uh, I'm guessing that your work is kind of in response to environmentalists' uh, claims that there should be better ways of controlling plants. But uh, I, I'm curious how uh, you interact with those environmentalists and what your either what your experience has been or what your strategy is for trying to get across your research findings and uh, enlighten them in some way. Wow. Well, yes, you're right. Uh, this research was spurred in response to uh, the environmentalists. Uh, FWC instituted what they called called the pause. Uh, a few years ago, where they halted all herbicide treatments for aquatic weed control in Florida as a as a response to public outcry because we were putting poison in the water. Uh, we can't have that. Um, and uh, as far as trying to communicate to the public, it's it's a challenge. Um, the a lot of our a lot of our kind of loudest most vocal <laughs> opponents are duck hunters, they're fishermen, and I, I know that they want the environment safe, but we do too. Um, I'm an environmental steward. My applicators are environmental stewards. And unfortunately, the public is under the impression that, for example, applicators get paid for every gallon of material they put out. That's not true. Um, and uh, they're sure that the applicators are getting kickbacks from chemical companies, and that's not true. And um, we were out in the field a couple days ago doing restoration research. There was no spray tank on the boat we were on, but there was an FWC logo on it. And a truck actually drove by us and yelled obscenities <laughs> out the window. I mean, really, really foul, blue, profane things at us um, because they were sure that we were there killing plants and we weren't. We we're actually collecting plants to use in restoration research. Um, I, I actually try hard not to deal directly with the public if I don't have to. Um, my applicators have been shot at. Uh, I had an applicator that actually took an arrow <laughs> in, in the chest. Uh, luckily, it didn't penetrate too far because it got caught on the, the life vest he was wearing. He's wearing a flotation vest, and the arrow got caught on that. But um, I essentially try to let the, the bigger wigs at the university deal directly with the public, and I focus on trying to train my applicators and give them the tools that they need to keep themselves safe and be environmental stewards. And, you know, we tell them if you encounter somebody who's hostile, walk away, get in your truck, get out of there because it's it's not worth it. Um, I don't know if that was a, a really suitable answer to your question, but but that's kind of how I deal with the public. I, I try not to deal directly with them if I can help it because they're just, they're angry. They don't want to listen to a viewpoint that doesn't confirm what's already in their head. Hmm. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's, that, that's an enlightening answer. <laughs> it's, it's a scary, it's a scary time to be an applicator. I really feel for my guys. I mean, they, they, there are days that they literally are taking their lives in their hands and they're just, they're trying to protect the environment and they're being assaulted for it. Yeah, then so. Mike, Mike Snell, I had not heard some of those war stories before, so thanks for sharing those. I just have a really quick thing I want to interject. People get busy, they don't read the, the rest of the story, so to speak. And, and so if you were to Google Diquat, you know, it's a group E carcinogen. But if you don't read any further, human nature tells you, it's like, oh, damn, there ought to be some fear here. It's, it's a carcinogen. But when you start reading further, it's like it actually hasn't harmed people to date, at least according to studies. Is that something that's ever been presented to you? Because uh, I think I could do a better job in the future, reminding people to keep reading beyond just the title. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, this the the whole um, 
the the I'm going to call it a conversation um, about glyphosate well, sure. and <laughs> carcinogenicity. And okay, it is it is as uh, as likely to cause cancer as bacon is and as beer is and um <laughs> so everything everything causes cancer if um if it's if you contact it at a high enough concentration um mm -hmm. so i think i think people are they're terrified of everything and they're looking for a target um and i do wish people were, would read more and i hope the day will come when people can be more open minded about everything and can be willing to listen to a different viewpoint instead of just, you know, grinding in their heels and going, no, you're not telling me what I want to hear. So you must be in the pocket of, of big ag. Yeah. So um, I yeah. see Sarah, Sarah Wallace has a question. Um, Sarah, yeah, can you unmute? Yes, thank you for your presentation. I'm sorry I came in late. But I was just going to ask, I am guilty as a horticulturalist of wanting to try new plants and new species. Um, how do we get the horticulture industry or what, um, I guess, not uh, stop points could be put in there so that we don't have as many invasives? Because I saw that a lot of them were introduced by us. Yeah, Sarah, that's an excellent question and an excellent point. And that's actually something that Dr. Snelly and I have been, um, we've had a number of workshops at our National Society on, on that exact thing, trying to find uh, ornamental plants, but uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to find cultivars of those that are less invasive. So for example, uh, lantana that doesn't produce seeds would be fantastic uh, because in Florida, you know, we've got a native lantana, but we have introduced lantanas as well. And those introduced lantanas outcompete the native, they hybridize with it. So if there's a seedless lantana, that's a great option. We can still have, you know, a really attractive, really unusual plant that's less invasive. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt now to Mike and let him uh, weigh in on this too. Well, it's funny you said that. We uh, have a veterinarian turned lantana breeder, uh, Green Valley, Missouri. And we have brought him a couple of times back when we could meet physically pre-plague. And uh, he was working on getting fruitless lantana for that very reason. Uh, so absolutely, we're trying to uh, we're, we're trying to the best of our efforts to uh, work with the industry and, and uh, present alternatives, but still profitable alternatives. And yeah, I think I think that's so true. And, and Sarah, I'm glad that you want to be responsible. And I, I think most gardeners do want to re be responsible. And so I think if you have a new plant that you're you're not really familiar with and you can't find out much about its growth habit or its invasive potential, you know, the safest way is to grow something like that in a container, ideally on your patio so uh, propagules of it can't get out and sort of see what happens with it. And if it, if it seems pretty well behaved, then, you know, just because it's introduced doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. And so we can we can grow these non native plants, we just have to kind of keep an eye on them and make sure that they don't get out into the wild and, and take over. Yeah, Lynn, thank you. Lynn, I noticed that a uh, friend Linda Davis is asking, do any of these treatments that you've discussed harm fish? Uh, there are two aquatic herbicides that are directly toxic to fish and our applicators are very well trained and that information is very clear on the label. The beautiful thing is those two products are not the only games in town. So um, herbicide selection is really important for avoiding off tar target damage and, you know, damage to fish and that sort of thing. And the rule of thumb is when you're treating a lake, you only treat a third of that lake at a time. So, and of course, one of the questions is why would you do that? And that's because um, even if you have a herbicide that's not direct, directly toxic to fish, you really need a certain number of plants in that 
aquatic system to be photosynthesizing and generating oxygen to add to the water column because fish need dissolved oxygen. So if you only treat a third of a system, uh, then you're still leaving a fair number of plants there that are alive and can photosynthesize and can provide that dissolved oxygen for fish. So it is 100% it is possible to avoid fish kills just through herbicide selection and proper application techniques. Thank you. Thank you. Who, who else has questions? We can go two or three minutes over for sure. I don't want to cut anybody off because uh, this is my first time to ever get Dr. Get us up here. Uh, who else has a question? And let us know if you're having problems with your mic. We'll make it work one way or the other. Donna, help me look as well, if you would, in the chat. But I think we've exhausted chat notes, maybe. Um, any other thoughts or questions? Before we jump off all together, I just want to remind everybody, y'all are free to email me whenever you want. Um, Dr. Snelly has my email address. I can, I can, I'll actually put it in the chat box right now for everybody. Uh, I'll try to send chat to everyone in meeting, uh, but I'm always happy to get emails. I, I'll help you however I can, um, and hopefully. If if y'all like me, maybe uh, Mike will have me back in the future. I'd love to come in person if uh, yeah. if COVID lockdown ever stops. <laughs> you know, I've been trying on that, and and we're more civilized, Lynn. We're not going to shoot arrows at you. We're not going to curse at you. We're just going to embrace you and and you know drain your knowledge. So we would love to get you up here at some point in time, and and until then, we'll just keep working um, virtually. Sadly, but it's better than nothing, of course. And I learned a great deal today. I'm sure I'll be writing you at three in the morning with some kind of a random thought. Um, please, folks, keep in touch with us for the next month. Uh, calendars change. And we had to make a change from what we first uh, put out in 2021. So Dr. Robin, Robin Brumfield is actually going to speak February the 17th, February the 17th. And you have that, though. When you register, you have the correct date. But if you have an old handout like I do, throw that away because it'll mess you up so focus in on february the 17th dr get us again we appreciate you your time your work um you made a great compelling argument for for yeah the 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 quote naturals were great 47 times more expensive that isn't even re remotely realistic in the real world for a, a myriad of reasons so that was a great take-home message as well as other principles and tenets you taught us today. Thank you for your time. And on this note, I think we'll go ahead and conclude. Look forward to huddling with everybody in about a, a month from now. Everybody have a have a great day. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn.